Please remain standing as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The lesson this morning is found on page 90 in the Pew Bibles and on page 68 in the New Testament portion of the Children's Bibles. This is Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. God. Thank you, Charles. You may be seated. The resurrection changes everything. It is something holy. It is something beautiful, and it is absolutely not an accident. You know, on this day, we get up and we try to say things like, well, it is like the beauty of, you know, those horrible snowy days, and then a tulip comes up through the ground, and then you think, wait a second, that's not right, because, you know, if you manage to get them in the ground, they usually, at least some of them come up, right, in the spring. Or then we'll say, oh, wait, it, it's like a caterpillar that goes into a cocoon, and it comes out as a butterfly. And you think, but wait a second, it's not like that either, because that's natural. That's what caterpillars do. And, and it kind of falls apart and feels really flimsy to compare a caterpillar, you know, to the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah, the risen Christ. And so we say it's like, and then you just stop. Because it isn't like anything or anyone else. We are not here just so we can remember something that happened a long time ago. We are here because we are right in the middle of the ongoing living Christ. We are not here just to, to compare one thing to another, but to be drawn into Christ. And we're here to live in awe and wonder and with questions, but with a greater awareness of the living, resurrected Christ, which is not like anything else or anyone else ever. Resurrection changes everything. You know, death screams. And death is loud. It's one thing when you're making arrangements. It's one thing when you still are at the funeral home and everybody's telling you great stories and you're remembering the good old days. But death screams when you're at the graveside and the casket is closed and you got to walk off. But in the resurrection, we hear not the scream of death, but we hear its defeat because the last word is God's great yes to life. It is not death. The last word is life. It is not the abandonment of Friday when Jesus says, where are you, God? You talked to me before. How come you're so quiet right now? It is instead the presence of God with us, not just as a baby of Bethlehem, but as the power of life. The last word is not murder at the hands of the Romans or the religious maniacs. It is the mystery of the resurrection. In confusion and pain in shock and grief and maybe fear, the women went as soon as possible to go back to the tomb. 
Now, I love how all the different Gospels say different stories. Uh, not totally different, but different details. It would be like if, if I experienced something and I called Bill and I said, Bill, Bill, guess what? Da, 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 da. And I had to tell him everything because I was so excited. But then, but then later I called Charles. And, and Charles, you'll never guess what happened. And maybe the stories, they would still both be true, but they have different details within them. So there's, there's a stone that's already rolled away or there's an earthquake and it rolls away. There are angels. There are gardeners. There are mistaken identities, a missing body. And in the midst of all that chaos, we had to be really careful. And they had to be really careful that they didn't miss the point. It wasn't the big thing, even though it's amazing, that Jesus' body was missing. It's that Jesus is alive and on mission. Jesus is alive and going on in the ministry of what he has always been doing. See, resurrection, it changes despair into hope. And it completes, or at least makes more complete, our understanding of Jesus' life and death. Rising in the stillness of pre-dawn, the disciples, the women, all those, some of them went, some of them did not. And they saw two piles of clothes. And they were terrified because they thought they've stolen his body. Isn't it bad enough that they torture him and they put him to death, but now they've got to mess with him when he's dead? Come on, give us a break. But then when you start to look, where it's recorded in the gospel, wait a second, grave robbers would move fast. Grave robbers would be in a hurry so that no one caught them. They weren't type A grave robbers that would fold everything up. So, hey, it probably wasn't grave robbers, right? It was an intentional, not in a hurry, all the time in eternity, to unban death and set it aside to never be picked up again. Some went to look. Some didn't know what to do. The women ran back and told tales. And you know, well, those women, they're always talking about something. Whamma, whamma, whamma. So why do we got to listen to them this morning? As they got to be the first evangelists. But in some way, each of them entered in that morning or later that afternoon into the story. It didn't make a lot of sense to them. That's what the Gospel of John says. Because no one there had really understood the scriptures. See, Jesus had said, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. And they got, I've been crucified, die, and their brain just went blank. Okay? In that defeat, and in that sadness, and in that fear... They didn't know what to think. In the Gospel of John, it says that the disciple that Jesus loved, the beloved disciple, looked in and believed. But it doesn't say what. Believed what? And in that, there's this opening in the Gospel that can draw each of us in. You see, we may not know for sure what we believe today. What we believed when we were five is not what we believe when we're 105, as the continuing life of Christ unfolds in us and through us. So there is room if, if we're not sure what we've seen, if we think it's an idle tale, if, if we want to see where the holes in his hands are. There's room in the story, and it invites each of us into this, that it becomes our life and our experience of the living Christ. Because you see, resurrection changes defeat into destiny. When that stone was rolled away, or pardon me, rolled closed on Friday, when it was rolled closed on Friday and it was sealed up, you have to have, you have, to have some inkling that they thought it's done. Not finished, but it's done, it is over. It was as if every expectation, every hope, everything they had left their homes for, left their families for, left their business for, had been put in the cross-cut shredder of the crucifixion and was in tatters. I don't think for one minute that any of the disciples, any of the followers of Jesus on that silent Saturday sat together and said, well, you know, this is about as bad as it can get, but if we put the right spin on it, 
Come on, we can, we can pull something out of this. We can, we can continue in some way. No, they took to their beds and they were sick with grief and they cried till they threw up and they were snotty nosed and red eyed and they were in pain. But think on the words. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And then all the Gospels say that they saw him. They saw him in different ways. They saw him as he appeared to them in the upper room. They saw him as they didn't know who he was at all. But some guy just came up and started walking with them while they were out for a stroll that afternoon. And suddenly they recognized him when he did what he had always done, when he broke the bread and he blessed it. They saw him when they recognized him when he was cooking breakfast for them on the Sea of Galilee, on the, on the beach there. They recognized him when they had gone back to what they'd always done, because what do you do when your hopes are dead? What do you do when your dreams have died? What do you do when you think you have stretched forward as far as you can and you get slapped back down? You go to what's familiar. So they went out fishing. And then they see this man on the beach who says, oh, you didn't catch anything, huh? Why don't, why don't you throw the nets on the other side? Now you've got to think they were thinking this. Uh, excuse me, we are professional fishermen. Don't you think we know how to get fish in this place where we've done this all our life? But then when they put the net down on the other side and it's full almost to breaking, but it doesn't, somebody says, it's Jesus. It's the Lord. It's Jesus. And they recognize him in the abundance and in the amazement. And there is that beautiful, beautiful moment for Mary, still at the tomb, on that early morning, and she recognized Jesus when he called her name. When he called her name. Peter found forgiveness and heard again, follow me. They all who had scattered found the inclusion come back. There's more. The resurrection changed their understanding not only of who Jesus was, but of who they were going to be and who they would never be again. Because they never could be people untouched by the life, death, and life of Jesus. They could never be people that were only Good Friday. They had the resurrection Sunday, and the resurrected Jesus changed cowardly men and women called crazy into fools for Christ. And that's what Jesus is still doing today, changing cowardly men and women called crazy into the fools for Christ who for the rest of our life we're going to be looking for him. For the rest of our life, we're going to want to have an experience, not just knowledge. For the rest of our lives, we're going to have to tell somebody about the time, whether it was in an Easter service or it was at the grocery store, or washing your car, making your bed, when you wake up at 3.11 in the morning over and over again. You know, resurrection reveals the love of God, and it also draws us into a deeper mystery. Rising the way he said it would happen... Jesus throws the disciples into another kind of chaos. They know what to do with death. They don't like it. They don't want to accept it, but they know how to handle it. The disappointment and the chaos and the agony. But resurrection? Resurrection? What do you do with that? That is not within our human and physical life on this plane. No one had ever seen it happen, which is why it helps us to remember. Now, here's an interesting thing I never thought about before. No one actually saw resurrection happen even that day. So as much as God reveals to us in the risen Christ, there was still in that resurrection moment Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. There weren't any nanny cams inside the tomb. So you don't know exactly what happened in that moment. So God will bring us up to the mystery and gather us into the story and invite us into the life, and there's still always a little bit more. There were no witnesses, and no one on earth can say what happened inside the tomb. They arrive after the fact just like us. And that's another way that we continue to know that it isn't just an old, old story, but it is the life that we can live today. It turned out, you know, the empty tomb, it's not the focal point. He is not here. He is risen, and the resurrection life is not going to stay in the tomb. Barbara Brown Taylor says that Jesus had outgrown his tomb. 
it was too small as a focus for the resurrection. Because to rise, one had people to do, and people to see, and things to do. The living one's business was to be among the living, to whom he appeared not just once, but over and over and over. And every time people came in contact with the risen Christ, every time we are in contact with the risen Christ, we are kinder, and we are gentler, and we will be changed if we will let him change us. Every time he came to them, they became more like him. Jesus, now that death was out of the way, now that we know that it will not be permanent and we don't have to put all of our fear or energy into death, he says, I want to remind you and show you how to live because to live well and to live the resurrected life, to live all the days of your life is going to mean that sometimes... You're going to find yourself being friends with someone that you don't like. It means that you are going to rise up and you're going to be in solidarity with someone in which you have nothing in common other than the sacredness of life that I have died to give you. It means that you're going to find yourself companioning, companioning with the abandoned and the forgotten and the outcasts it means that as you continue to die to all of those markers that draw you away from me, as you die to self, as it is said sometimes, you will find that yourself is fulfilled in certain hope of what it means to really live. See, resurrection changes everyone, or it can, not just Jesus. Lost hope, brokenhearted, a little fuzzy about your dreams or where you go next. Maybe you're a youth and, you know, the pressure's on. You're going to pick a college, going to pick a major, got to find a wife, got to find a husband, got to find a spouse, got to, you know, got to get a house. Or maybe, you know what, you've got all of that. You've got everything you've ever asked for, ever wanted, ever prayed for, and you still think, boy, this is about as empty as that tomb on Sunday morning. Jesus enters into life and is our life. Let the resurrected Christ change your life. For many of us, Easter and the life as the people of the resurrection, it begins when we hear Jesus call our name. Have you ever heard that? Can you maybe, can you maybe hear it this morning? Can you maybe pray, God, if I can't hear it now, then let me hear it this afternoon, or let me hear it next week, but let me hear that you call my name, that you specifically invite me as far away as I have been, as many times as I've fallen, as, as much doubt as I have, you know me by name and you want me to be part of the life that you give. Encounters with the living Lord, they free us from death and every entombing circumstance that wants to swallow us up in ordinariness and despair or ennui or just plain old boredom because we experience the living Christ because we have found to our surprise that the one thing that we can always share is not just the knowledge, not just the Sunday school book, not just the really cool prayer or song that we can take home and quote, but that somehow, in some way, there was a day, there was a moment, there is still the times when it's real, not just in the long ago, but it's real for us. And it's real now. Because Easter is not a day, it is a state of life. We experience the living Christ, and we don't ever know where he's going to show up. Except maybe we do. Maybe we have some really, really good clues. Not just on this Easter Sunday morning, but always. Because you see, Jesus was up and about the mission. Jesus was doing what he's done, which is show us how to live. It is as the one artist said, love is to rise up and call us by name. Because the resurrection changes everything. And as we turn not only to the tomb, but then away into the life, as we turn not only from the darkness and the death, but we turn to the resurrection, it will change us. Because rising up out of hatred is love in action. Rising up out of death 
is life eternal. Rising up out of the warring madness that we see day in and day out will be peace. And rising out of all the strife and division, whether it is in our families or in our workplace or even in our churches, God says there will be reconciliation. That is life. Rising out of any shame and guilt we have is identity. A newness. We are not who we were. We are not who we will be. But today we are the beloved children of God. That is our identity. To live into and to receive. Rising out of our brokenness will be relationship and renewal. And the remembering, the re-putting back together of everything that has been lost. Rising out of pride that divides and hates and hurts will be the ability to have power with others and to change the world. It will be the very presence of Christ and purpose not for disciples long ago, but each of us in this day. Rising up from just the sickness of sin is healing. And there is hope and there is help. And rising up from defeat is strength and sustenance and surprise. Surprise. That God is not done, that God is still moving and living and walking among us. Surprise at what God will do in your life. Surprise what God will do in your children's life, in your grandchildren's life. What God can do in the congresses of the United States and across the globe in the warring madness. Surprise at what God can do in me. Not just on the grand scale, but in the tiniest and the most resistant of spirits. He's going to roll that stone away. And rising, always more than we can explain in the mystery, always more than we can expect, always present, always new, always in all. Rising and calling our name and your name and your name and your name and yours way back there in the corner and yours back here hiding behind the piano. Calling your name and my name. Because resurrection can change everything. It has changed everything. Embrace the gift, not just of the babe of Bethlehem, but of the risen Christ. Because he walks with you, and he talks with you, and he leads you in power and might in the ways that God would have us live. So welcome. Welcome to the Easter life. Amen. I invite you.